Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, yuwafi ni'amahu wa yukafi'u mazidahu, sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alimtana wa zidina ilman ya kareem. Can I ask the brothers also to come back here on the side again? So, um, continuing on with the concept of the heart, the first type of heart that we discussed before the break was, uh, which type was it? Al-Saleem. Al-Qalb al-Saleem. Tayyip. And we gave two meanings for the word Al-Qalb al-Saleem. So would somebody like to repeat them for me? Saved and bitter. Saved and bitter. And meaning? Or the, or the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's right. So, you know, about these hearts also, Allah's Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, particularly this Al-Qalb al-Saleem, he said, you know, يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ أَقْوَامٌ أَفْئِدَتُهُمْ مِثْلُ أَفْئِدَةَ الطَّيْرِ That on that day, you have people that will enter Jannah. The example of their hearts is like the example of the hearts of birds as they stick to their business extremely pure this is the hadith of the Prophet and just a couple of days ago actually one of the ulama died uh, and uh, I saw somebody's Facebook message and they said that this individual when I look at him he reminds me of this hadith of the Prophet that extremely pure heart when you meet a person, sometimes you're just like, why did I meet this guy? Because all you can see is him trying to cause problems. His heart is twisted. His mind corrupt. And others you meet, what you know, people, a lot of us who are from Pakistan would call a lucky guy. And in fact, Allah's Prophet ﷺ mentioned in this hadith, uh, in another narration, he said, أَكْثَرُ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ الْبُلْحَ He said, most of the people that will enter Jannah are what they call al-bulh. What's a bulh? Al-bulh is the plural of the word ablah. Ablah is basically an idiot. And again, the Prophet ﷺ is not referring to idiots over here. But linguistically, it comes out to mean Idiot. Sometimes you can use the same word that means one thing, but it comes out to mean something else in another context. That's why you have the word yatahannath, which means to commit a sin. But Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha explained yatahannath in that hadith to mean yata'abbad, that the Prophet used to go to yaqar hira and he would do ta'abbad. You remember that? Yeah. So, uh, al bulh over here, what the Prophet is trying to say is basically. For those of you that are Pakistani, you'll understand right away, and then I'll explain in English. Allah Hibah. It's referring to people that are just so pure. You look at the guy, and all you can see is a worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, most of the people, he minds his own business. Nothing but coming to the masjid, praying his salawat, going home, and doing his own thing. And you don't see him being indulged in the same type of things that you see other people being indulged in. You don't see him getting caught up in the sicknesses and the illnesses of society that you have other people being caught up in. And Allah's Prophet is talking about this individual Most of the people of Jannah will be like this, low profile. They stick to themselves, nobody knows them. And they're just al bulha They're just those people that worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's their job, that's what they know. Why? Because the heart of this individual is like the heart as Allah's Prophet he said in the other hadith is like the heart of a bird. Extremely pure. Extremely pure. So this is the first type of heart. And the second type of heart is that heart which is extremely dead. Al-Qalb al-Mayyit. 
It's absolutely dead. How so? It doesn't know its Lord. Allah Azza wa Jal. It doesn't know to worship its Lord. Allah Azza wa Jal. It's always standing by its desires. And the desires should be tamed by the guidance of the Prophet Allah's Prophet said None of you is a true believer until his desires become tamed with that which I have brought. So this person, all he can do is indulge in his desires. Sicknesses of the heart can be divided into two things. The first is desires, and the second is ash-shubuhat, doubts. And the lost Prophet ﷺ, as we said about desires, he said, None of you is a true believer until his desires become limited to that which I brought. And about shubuhat, Allah's Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever cleanses himself and stays away from his desires or doubts, from doubtful affairs, gray area. He's become free, he's freed himself from accusation in his deen and his honor, and his honor. A person should always try to free himself of accusation and his honor. And this set was the way of the Prophet ﷺ. When you're saw and you're caught somewhere doing something that could be translated in two different ways, you have two different aspects that need to be dealt with. One, the actual individual doing the action. The actual individual doing the action. He stays away from situations which can cause his honor to be destroyed. And then you have, and that is the example of the Prophet ﷺ when he was walking out of the building and he said, Inna ha Safiya. So down guys, it's just Safiya. Because they might have thought that it was somebody else that the Prophet ﷺ was with. His wife. And the other is, as Al Harith Al Muhasabi says in Risala Al Mustarshidin, he says, "Wara'i hamka bi husn ta'wil, wara'i dhanka, wahfad dhanka bi husn ta'wil." He said, "Protect your thoughts about other people by translating their affairs in the best of manners." Husn they call it. When you see an individual walking with a woman, your first thing that should come to your mind is that it might be his sister, it might be his wife, and you're sure he's not married, then you say he got married. Then protect your brain and what you think with it. By what? By translating situations in the best of manners. By translating situations in the best of manners. So you have a shahwat and you have a shubuhat. In terms of shahwat, Allah's Prophet gave us an equation and that is to limit your shahwat into that which the Prophet brought. In terms of shubuhat, you have efforts being put in from both sides. One, a person stays away from shubuhat for what reason? So that his honor is not put at risk and his deen is not put at risk. And from the other angle, you have the individual that sees this person indulging in a shubha, he translates the situation in the best of manners. He translates the situation in the best 
of manners. By the way, there's a note here for shubuhat, for doubts. The ulama, they say, and this is the majority position, that an individual should, it's an obligation upon an individual to indulge in a shubha, that which he's not sure about, whether it's halal or haram, and in some ulama they say it's halal, others say it's haram. If all of them say it's haram, then it's not a shubha anymore. It's considered an ijma, a consensus of the Islamic scholars. You must indulge, it's an obligation upon an individual to indulge in a shubha if his parents ask him to do such. And they force him and compel him to do doing such. So for example, an individual, a person feels that taking pictures, he's not sure if it's haram or not. Some ulama, they'll say it's haram. Others will say, no, it's fine. So you avoid, because it's a shubha for you. You didn't understand the argumentations of both sides. And your father comes to you and says, I want you to take a picture, son. You can't say to him at that point, don't take, my, don't take a picture. Because you're not sure if it's haram. But if it becomes certain to you that this is haram at that point, no compulsion. لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخلق. There's no, there's no obedience of a creation of Allah subhanahu wa taala. You don't obey a creation of Allah subhanahu wa taala in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa taala. However, if you're not sure, it's a shubha. At that point, the ulama they said it's wajib for an individual to follow his parents in that. So this is something to be noted. This individual is called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he doesn't answer. He's called to the hereafter. And he's called to the hereafter. Those that don't believe, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. في آذانهم وقر There is a heaviness in their ears. That even if you call them, they can't hear. And even if they hear, they can't understand. أولئك, the example of those, ينادون من مكان بعيد The example of those is like the person that you call from a distance. Very far away. How so? What does that mean? Who's talking? You. Okay, go ahead. Huh? They can't hear you. When you look at a person that is a kilometer down, you're using binoculars to look at. If you call him, Ya Zayd, Ya Fulan, Ya Illan, is he going to hear you? Is he going to hear you? He won't hear you. So the example of this person whose ears are full of this heavy sound so that he can't hear is like the example of that person that is at a distance and he's called but he won't be able to hear even if he's standing watching for me there's a lot of balagha in this verse a lot of eloquence think about an individual that is a kilometer down and you call his name and another right in front of you how can you compare the two? But Allah is comparing the two. That just as that one doesn't hear, just like that, this one right here won't hear. This individual with a dead heart, he's called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he doesn't hear. And then you have another type of heart. And that is the heart that is sick. القلب المريض so we talked about the first heart, which is what? Huh? Al-Qalb al-Saleem or Al-Qalb al-Sahih. And then we talked about the second type of heart, which is what? The dead heart. And the third is close to the dead, but it hasn't entirely died yet. It's sick. A moment goes by and he becomes indulged in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another goes by and his desires along with the call of shaitan are more beloved to him. He's called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tears come to his eyes. His call to the way of Satan rejoices and laughs. 
And this again goes back to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. In al-qulub la tasbih. Verily hearts become rusty. This individual is always in a dilemma, in a fight. Between his soul and between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandments. In al-qulub la tasbih. Verily these hearts, they become rusty. كما يصدق الحديث Just as iron becomes rusty. So, it's a wa'a. He's got a heart that's a wa'a. It's a vessel. As Ali, Ali radiallahu ta'ala and him called it, a heart to be a vessel. He said, inna mal qulub wa'a. Verily, hearts are nothing but vessels. At a moment, his heart is full, full and filled up with filths. The shaytan had cast it into his heart. And his nafs, his own desires, had cast it into his heart. So it becomes full. And he wants to clean it up now. So he starts cleansing that vessel of his. He wipes it clean. And shaitan comes and makes it dirty again. Filthy again. Back and forth, fighting between himself and his soul. Between what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from him, and what shaitan wants from him, what his own nafs wants from him. So this is the example of the heart that is sick. It needs to be cured. cured. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ talked about when he talked, gave the example of the Arab. And he gave you a cure. The Sahaba asked, وَمَا جَلَأُهَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ What exactly is it that will purify this heart, O Prophet of Allah ﷺ? So what did they say? We mentioned this hadith a little bit earlier. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? Huh? Huh? Yeah. Remembering death. Yeah. Dhikr al maut Remembering death. Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What else? And reciting Quran. And reciting Quran. So... The nights of this individual, if they're spent in the ma'asiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mornings he goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the individual with the sick heart. Then we look at what exactly is it that makes this heart sick. So now we're getting into another concept. We're done with the three different types of hearts. Who wants to sum them up for me? Nabi. Do you remember the three hearts? Pure heart and the sick one. Yeah. So the pure heart, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all one. The dead heart and the sick heart. The dead heart becomes dead when it continues to go through sicknesses and it's never cured, it's never helped. What exactly is it that makes this heart sick? We talked about that as well. The sicknesses of the heart divide, are divided into two different categories, we said. What is that? Uthmana. No cheating. You can't call a friend. <laughs> Shubuhat and shahwat, desires, and what doubts. Now, when Allah's Prophet وسلم, he gave the cure dhikr al note and he said tilawat al Quran, also uh, reciting Quran. Allah's Prophet وسلم, really knew what he was talking about because, in terms of the Quran itself, and we'll talk about that just in a little while probably tomorrow actually the Quran entails both types of cures because you have the types of sicknesses you have shubuhat doubts then you have shahawat desires the Quran has cure for both these types of sicknesses how do you cure desires you remind it of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you give it admonition you tell the heart that you're only here for a little while and then you die 
You remind the heart of the fact that it's either you're leading a life that will end into eternal bliss or it will be problematic for the rest of eternity. So that's how we did cure desires. And the cure for doubts, what better cure than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech? Time in and time out, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds you of situations where people said such and they did this and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then strikes a parable for them to understand what's going on. Mathaluhum, you know, all the time in the Quran. Mathal al-Nathina kafar, you know, method, 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 all the parables. Why is he doing that? He's trying to make you realize those doubts that people raise. This is how you combat them. This is how you combat them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the cure in his book for both of these types of sicknesses. Now, the sicknesses that we wanted to discuss, there's a lot of them, are particularly four. Particularly four things. And these are what they call the four poisonous things to the heart. Four poisonous things to the heart. And what exactly are these four poisonous things to the heart? There are a number of things that poison an individual's heart. But the ulama in particular take these four and explain them in more detail because ever so often do people fall into these four particularly. And really sins at large you know, poison an individual's heart. Look at what Ibn al-Mubarak said, رَأَيْتُ الذُّنُوبَ تُمِيتُ الْقُلُوبُ وَقَدْ يُرِثُ الذُّلَّ إِدْمَانُهَا وَتَرْكُ الذُّنُوبِ حَيَاتُ الْقُلُوبُ وَخَيْرُ لِنَفْسِكَ عَصِيَانُهَا So I saw that sins make a person's heart die. تُمِيتُ الْقُلُوبُ وَقَدْ يُرِثُ الذُّلَّ إِدْمَانُهَا And if a person continues and continues and becomes an addict of sinning, it makes him really, it puts him through a lot of humiliation. وَتَرْكُ الذُّنُوبَ And now he gave you the cure as well. And if you leave off sinning, if you leave off sinning, حَيَاتُ الْقُلُوبَ That's where you find the enrichment of your life, hayat al of your heart. That's how you can replenish and bring back your hearts to life. And it's better for you, you, O child of Adam, it's better for you to disobey your own soul. If you walk down the street, and you see something you're not supposed to see, lower your gaze. It's better for you to disobey your soul. If your friends at school call you to muharram, to something haram, drinking, drugs, alcohol, all these things are haram. Then shy down because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching. If you don't shy down from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least do it from Allah. And that's why Allah's Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, He said, Man, whoever, Man hafad al aqla wa ma wa'a, wal batna wa ma hawa, and whoever protects the intellect and everything that, that is that which is within the intellect, wal batna wa ma hawa, and the tummy or the stomach and that which is within the stomach, as in eating nothing but halal. This is the individual that has become shy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just as he should be shy. So if you don't shy down from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي as the Prophet said, if you don't, if you're not, you don't have any shyness, you don't have any bashfulness, فَصْنَعْ بَعْشَيْ Do everything that you please. If you don't shy, from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't forget Allah is watching you. Don't forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you. So the first of those sicknesses is fudur al-kalam, talking too much. Talking too much. 
That's why we have the example of Ibn al-Jawzi rahmatullah alayhi when he wanted to you know, sit with people or people wanted to sit with him rather. He was afraid of only one thing, the type of things that they would be saying. He was afraid of people talking to him about things that do not concern them. That do not concern them. He said to himself in a book, Ibn Jawzi had a very unique characteristic. When he would write a book, what he would do is that he would speak to the book like it's his best friend. He'd speak to the book as if it is its best friend. Because he didn't used to befriend people as much as he would befriend his works. He would sit there writing in the book as if it is his closest friends. So when you read his books, you feel like he's talking to you and you're having a conversation with him. So he says in his book over here, that it's one of two things. When I go and meet people, it's one of two things. The first of those two things, it's either I'll have to indulge in, what that, in that which they indulge in. Backbiting. His nose is too large. Did you see that ugly hijab pin she got? Man, where'd she get that? Man, her feet are real big, man. How can a woman have feet this size? You looking fat. So he's afraid in Chosi here. Say either I'll have to indulge in these kind of lowly conversations. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like for an individual to indulge in lowly conversations. Rather, the Prophet ﷺ himself he mentioned in the hadith, he said, Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the most grand of deeds. And he hates the worthless conversations and worthless deeds and worthless actions. So he says to himself, he said, either I'm going to be rude to them and I'll tell them stop, or I'm going to go and meet them and I'll have to come to talk to them about these kind of things, people. He's in this dilemma and he wrote for pages on about this dilemma of his. Because he's afraid of indulging in pointless talk, vain talk. And there, anything you say, you'll be asked about. So what do, we, what do you think he did? <laughs> he devised himself a solution. Talk about creativity. Extremely creative, mashallah. What he did is, he said, I'm going to waste time by meeting these people, by talking to them, and they want to meet me. He's an alim. He said, I'm going to do something useful during that time. He took out his pen and he didn't have this one. By the way, I love this pen right here. It's the best pen. I import them all the way to Saudi Arabia. If somebody knew what's in this pen, they would buy it as well. Zebra Z grip. Very useful pens. So, what he did is, he didn't have a zebra, a zegrip. He didn't have this, they didn't have Walmart back then. He had to have pens that he can sharpen on his own. So he'd sharpen his own pen. He'd sharpen his own pen. He didn't have paper like this one right here. He didn't have that. Ibn al-Jawzi rahmatullahi. He didn't have books that were binded like this right here. He didn't have that. 
So he said, during the time that I meet people, yes, I will converse with them, I'll steer the conversation the right way. I won't let them discuss these kind of pointless things, but I also don't want to waste my time. So you would set a time on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, a sign in his house where he accepts people to come visit him. But at that moment, he'll be sharpening his pens. He'll be fixing up the paper so that he can start writing. He would bind the works that he'd already written. So that the time spent and the conversations, even if he's conversing, it's not wasteful because these things, he said, they don't require mind. Even if I use my mind with something else, I'm still doing this that is useful. Even if I talk about something else to them at the same time, I might be doing some vain talk, possibly. But usually when you're around an alim, there's no vain talk because everybody starts asking questions that have piled up for a long time. I might be doing that, but at least I'll not waste my time. So, you know, fudur al-kalam, talking, you know, vain talk, pointless conversations. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَا يَتَكَلَّمُ بِالْكَلِمَةِ مَا يَتَبَيَّنُ فِيهِ يَزِلُّ بِهَا فِي النَّارِ سَبْعِينَ خَرِيفًا وَمَا بَيْنَ الْمَشْرِقِ He said, an individual speaks of something بِالْكَلِمَةِ Just with one statement, because of one statement, he might fall in the pits of hell more than 70 years. Just because of the statement he made. And that's why when, they, when the Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'adh, he says, Kufa alayka hadha. He said, can you stop? He said, take control of your tongue. Mu'adh what did he say? He said, so, O Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, will we be asked about that which we speak? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, of course he will. ثَكِلَتْكَ أُمُّكَ يَا مُحَافِ وَهَلْ يُكَبُّ النَّاسُ عَلَى وُجُوهِهِمْ وَقَالَ عَلَى مَنَخِرِ مِلَّ حَصَائِدُ وَالْسَنَتِهِمْ Say, may your mother lose you, O Mu'ath. It's a figure of speech in the Arabic language. Will people be thrown in the hell fire except because on their faces, except because of that which they said, or that which their tongues have earned? So of course you'll be asked about what you say. That's why the first thing that the ulama usually talk about is vain talk. It's a vain talk. Talking points. The second thing is looking at things that a person shouldn't be looking at. Fudul and nal. Looking at things, muharramat. Things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't made lawful for you to look at. The ulama, when speaking about you know, the gaze the verse that they usually start off with is the following verses from Surah An-Nur where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَصْنَعُونَ وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنْ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُنْ He says, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغْضُضُ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنْ Say to the believing men that they should lower their gazes. وَيَحْفَظُ فُرُوجَهُنْ At the same time, they should also protect their private parts from haram. ذَلِكَ أَزْكَالَهُمْ You want tazkiyat al-nafs? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you in the Qur'an where the tazkiyat al-nafs is. That, as in lowering your gazes and protecting your private parts, it's more pure for you. That's where your 
تزكي زاد ذلك أزكى لهم that surely is more pure for them as in the believing man he didn't stop there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you don't believe me that this is where your tazki is at? This is where your purity is at? He said, In Allah, khabirun bima yasna'un. Verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly what He's created. He knows the human being and the way it works. So if you want tazki to nafs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to you right here that this is where your tazki is at. Allah has created you. In Allah, khabirun bima yasna'un. Verily, He knows exactly that which she's manufactured, that which she's created. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues and says, And say to the believing woman, such as well. That they should lower their gaze. That they should lower their sights when they see something that is haram. By the way, it's haram for a woman to look at a man. Pointlessly. Really. Some women seem to believe that it's only haram the other way around. This is the case. I've come across women that believe that it's only the other way around. If a woman pointlessly looks at another man, even the face that is not to be covered by a man, it's not permissible. Without a reason. If you have a transaction, the ulama, they said that's a different case. Because for transactions, you know, um, you should be looking at one another. So you're sure that it's the right person that you're doing your transaction with. And that's why I usually advise women when they're going through airport security to take off your niqab. Because the ulama, they give you an exception over here. We are doing a transaction. You're entering another country, so they need to make sure that it's you. It's a transaction. This is amongst those situations where particularly ulama have said that you should be looking at the other person. If somebody says to you, that you have a house and you're about to sell your house two hundred thousand dollars three hundred thousand dollars and he's not sure that it's you and you sign the paper and then it turns out it really isn't you then that individual that paid three hundred thousand bucks is going to have a car and he will be, he'll be mad that he paid three hundred thousand bucks to somebody that he shouldn't have been paying that money to. So that's why the ulama they said in this kind of a situation, it's better for the individual to make sure that it's the right person that he's purchasing the house from. Similarly, when you're going through a country to another, it's okay. If they're going to give you trouble about the fact that you have your naqab on, then take it off. Just through the security and put it back on when you come back. Out of the, you know, the airport. So, uh, for women, it's also haram to look at men, just as it is for men as well. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started off by the men. Because usually you'll find a lot of men sneaking in their peaks. Yeah. And say to the believing men that they should lower their gaze. That's the reality of it. The example of looking at something that is haram. The example that the ulama usually give is the example of a garbage chute. Does anybody know what a garbage chute is? Huh? Does anybody know what a garbage chute is? Where you throw the garbage out. They say, if you look at something that, that which is muharram, the example of that is like the example of a garbage chute, which is basically a garbage dispenser. And the garbage, when you put it into that garbage chute, it goes down, 
and it's collected in a room, a larger garbage can. So the ulama they said, the example of your eyes is like that shoot. When you look and look and look at the muharramat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, things that Allah has made haram, one, two, three, slowly that garbage piles up into an individual's heart. Slowly but surely, this vessel about which Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu speaks, the heart, will fill up. And thereafter, there won't be any room for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you filled your heart up with the garbage by looking in the wrong places. By looking at things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram. So the second thing is fudul al nazar Looking at the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram. And amongst the things that also should be noted, noted in this verse that we just spoke of, قُلِّ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنَ أَمْصَارِهِمْ Okay? Is that right after the, these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Allah نُورُ السَّمَوَاتِ Verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the light of the heavens and the earth. So the ulama they said that the relation between this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the believing men and the believing women from looking away from that which is haram. Okay? The example of this And the fact that right after that, a few verses down, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah nuru samawati wal ard. Oh, over here they got this verse as well. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. They said that the reason for this is because of the fact that when a person stays away, you know, it's like a hidden message in the Quran. And there's a lot of places where there's hidden messages. It's only for a person that has intellect that he can ponder. That Allah is trying to say that if you do that, only then will you be able to illuminate your path by the light that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. And that's why when you look at an individual that fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll, usually you'll have him lowering his gaze. you find his face extremely bright. you find his face extremely bright. That's why some of the ulama they said, you know, about a person whose face is extremely bright, they said they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at night in the dark. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala envelops their faces with his own nur in the morning. Extremely bright. And secondly, you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's nur and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illuminating the path for you to guidance. All of that, if an individual is able to protect his gazes and in turn his heart from becoming filthy of that which is haram. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautifies the creation of these individuals and also paths, gives them the correct path to walk on. Because it's difficult. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the people that incur this difficulty. Those that struggle in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's path, Allah very verily guides him to the correct path. He didn't say it would be easy, he said those that struggle is difficult. But you gotta struggle. That's why we said earlier on, Tazkiyatul Nafs requires a lot from an individual himself. That's why Allah said, Qad aflaha min Attributed that Tazkiyat to the individual himself. Prosperous is the one that purifies his own soul. And with that being said, we've taken two of the poisonous acts to the heart. And inshallah ta'ala will take the rest of the two and the rest of the session tomorrow. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه